I'm Dr. Dwight Ackerman, Chief Medical Editor for Review of Myopia Management, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. We're truly honored to have two world experts joining us tonight to discuss this very important topic. We have Professor Jennifer Harthen, who is a professor at the Illinois College of Optometry and chief of the Cornea Center for Clinical Excellence. Welcome, Dr. Harthen. Thank you. We have Dr. Monica Young joining us from Australia. Dr. Young is the executive director of the International Myopia Institute and also an assistant professor at the University of Canberra. Welcome, Dr. Young. It's a pleasure to be here, Dwight. Thank you very much. Very good. So we've uh, created a, a list of important questions to ask our panelists. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Before we begin though, just a, a quick note for, for our audience. If you have any questions you'd like us to discuss, if there's something that isn't quite clear, please don't hesitate to enter your question into the chat box. At the conclusion of our discussion, we will try to answer as many of those as possible. So let's begin, let's jump right in here with Dr. Monica Young. And Monica, the first question I have for you is that it's often been stated that childhood myopia is a global pandemic. What does this really mean? This is a great question and something that I had to think about a little because the word pandem pandemic and epidemic are terms that are often used interchangeably, but they're actually quite different. So let's just say, talk about what an epidemic is. It's a disease that affects a large number of people within a community, population or region. And then a pandemic is an epidemic that's spread over multiple countries or continents. So the really tricky thing is that currently there's no threshold set for how many regions need to be affected to qualify as a pandemic. And right now, what we're seeing is that myopia is definitely an epidemic in many parts of East Asia, such as China, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, and Singapore. And myopia is starting to increase in other parts of the world, such as the USA. So based on this kind of uh, prevalence that we're seeing, it's probably most accurate to say that myopia is already an epidemic in parts of East Asia and fast becoming a global pandemic with the trends that we're seeing at least by 2050. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. That's an excellent uh, explanation of epidemic and pandemic. So what about the United States? What, what the prevalence of myopia in school-aged children in the United States? And, and how has this prevalence changed over the past 30 years? So the prevalence in the US is quite interesting. So the work that we did in the Holden et al. study, we looked at the Susan Vitale data from the National Health and Nutrition Exam Survey and modelled it. And we estimated that in 2000, the prevalence of myopia in school-aged children in the US, if we're looking at five to 19-year-olds, was about 17%. And then by 2020 or now, we estimated it to be about 25% of all school-aged children. And then by 2050, we're expecting at least 40% of school-aged children in the US will have myopia compared with 60% of the whole US population. But we can also see from um, actual studies done such as the National Health and Nutrition and Exam Study, they found that in the US between people 12 to 54 years of age, myopia went from 26 to 42% in only a 30 year period. And then in certain groups such as a South Southern California study that was done in 2013, they found that about 42% of the kids in that study had myopia. So it really depends where in the US you're looking at because myopia prevalence is very much impacted by the ethnicity as well as the education levels and academic pursuits, I think. But we should mm -hmm. definitely be concerned that we're seeing these changes in the US today. Yes, indeed, indeed. I often quote, the, the Southern California study that, that you mentioned uh, that, that in school age children, it, it's about 40 to 42% in Southern California, so. Yeah, it's really frightening to see those numbers already now. And the fact is not everyone's doing myopia management even in the US and, it, and hopefully we can change things. 
Indeed, indeed. And we'll certainly dig into that uh, a little bit more as the uh, discussion progresses. So, of course, everyone is asking why. You know, why has the prevalence increased so much? What, what's causing this rapid change in the prevalence of myopia? Yeah, so the understanding has changed a lot. In the past, we always thought that myopia was dictated by genetics. So if someone in your family had myopia, you're definitely going to be myopic and there was nothing you could do and your spectacles would just keep increasing over time until you reached adulthood. But now the research is showing that we know that most of the myopia we see in school-aged children around us is is mostly affected by environmental or lifestyle factors and that the actual genetic component of these types of myopia is quite low. So in terms of myopia and genetics, you can think of genetics as what loads the gun and the environment triggers it, which is how my colleague, Dr. Judith Stern explained it. So some people might have a higher genetic risk than others, but the IMI white paper on genetics reported that only about five to 35 percent of the variation in refractive error was explained by inheritance. So that means 65% of or more of the, the inheritance of refractive error um, can be um, <coughs> modulated by the environment. So that means as practitioners, we have a lot of you know, ability to modify um, you know, myopia development in children. And if we look at parts of East Asia where myopia prevalence is about 80 to 90% in high school children, there was very little myopia in the parental generation. So we can see that genetics can't explain most of what we see today. Well, very good. We'll certainly talk more about uh, environmental uh, modifications here in just a moment. So thank you for that very nice summary. Dr. Harthen, let's jump to you and let's talk about some of the uh, interventions that are currently available to uh, slow the progression of myopia. Yeah, so I, again, no, there's ahead. a number number of inventions here. Let's let's talk first of all, of all about traditional single vision soft and rigid contact lenses. So that's slow? yeah, that's so that's so fascinating to me. So I think too, just kind of wrapping our heads around like what is myopia management just in general. I think that there's a lot of misconception on what that is and what are we trying to accomplish with that? We're not just, you know, purely trying to correct someone's vision, right? To make their vision clearer. What is the purpose of us initiating myopia management therapy? So I think that's number one is like, what's the ultimate goal in doing this? Um, and what we're really trying to do is, right, we're trying to prevent um, the axial elongation from worsening, or we are trying to delay the incidence of myopia. So I think just kind of wrapping our heads around the whole myopia management, just discussion and understanding of it, I think then will help in terms of selecting an appropriate treatment um, versus just perhaps selecting single vision glasses or contact lenses. And I think, you know, sometimes that's easy to do. We select single vision, you know, contact lenses, whether they're soft or they're GPs. And just from the evidence that we have, you know, it may be inconclusive as to wearing single vision contact lenses or glasses worsen myopia. But when we look at the evidence that's out there comparing, you know, the literature in soft multifocals or orthokeratology, when they're comparing the effect of that treatment to the control group, which is either you know, the single vision contact lenses or spectacles, we can see that there is better control with the, 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 the um, myopia management group. So uh -huh. I think we kind of just have to wrap our heads around what is actually myopia management um, and understanding that some of the treatment options are off label. Um, and just have a better understanding as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So would it be safe to say that traditional single vision, soft and rigid gas permeable contact lenses don't make myo myopia worse, but they don't right. see the progression either. Right, correct, correct, yes. correct. And yes. you know, as far as you know, the GPs, you know, if they are doing anything with that alignment fit, it's not in terms of controlling that axial elongation. If they're doing anything, it's they're just flattening that central cornea. Um, uh -huh. So as far as they're not making it worse, but they're not doing anything to slow it down. So you've mentioned axial length a few times now. Yes. <laughs> Would you say that uh, myopia is an axial length disease? 
Yeah, I would. Um, and I think really to be monitoring these patients on a regular basis, it should be a measurement that we're taking routinely, um, you know, perhaps every six months for sure annually, especially if we are uh, treating these patients with orthokeratology, right? These patients are wearing these lenses at night and they have no correction during the day. So to really measure refractive error is not a viable option to measure progression on those patients. To, uh -huh. So to really see if that treatment is working, axial length is what we need to be measuring. Uh -huh. Fully agree. Fully agree. So let's dig in a little bit more uh, to overnight orthokeratology, you know, very popular method of slowing the progression of myopia. Um, how effective is overnight orthokeratology in terms of slowing progression? Yeah, so looking, you know, at kind of how it works, right? So the whole thought is that it minimizes that hyperopic defocus um, by wearing the, that lens design. And there are many options available, but looking at the different studies that are out there, the efficacy can range anywhere from 30% to 59% um, over that, you know, two to three year period with that five year reduction rate of about 30%. You know, there are great studies that are out there, the Lorx study, the Romeo, the HM Pro, and now we're seeing a studies that are also also looking at the toric lenses as well and um, looking at the higher myopes as well. Um, but that efficacy we're looking, we're seeing anywhere from about 30 to 59% with an average around 45. Mm -hmm. So a very effective intervention. Yeah. And, you know, just looking at it from a personal, um, you know, I have a young child who has progressed a diopter in a year um, with all of this online learning that she was doing <laughs> this past year um, and, you know, something that we started to initiate. So, um, you know, taking it on a personal level, um, started to initiate that this summer and so far so good, but definitely measuring that axial length is going to be a key component. Um, but from having that personal understanding and reading the studies myself, trying to convince my husband about trying to do this, somebody who's not as well versed was another conversation. So I think it's having that supporting evidence, using that evidence-based, you know, mm -hmm. uh, treatment to talk to the parents and have select a treatment uh, that these patients and these parents can get on board with, uh, that they can comply with um, is going to be key to success, no matter what option we select. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. Let's jump ahead and talk about soft lenses, dual focus and center yeah. distance, multifocal lenses. How effective are they in slowing the progression of myopia? Yeah, you know, it's similar. We have a great, great research that's out as well, looking at two year, three year, um, you know, as whether we're doing, you know, the soft multifocals, making sure that it's the center distance design and not um, the center near it has to be the center distance or whether it's the dual focus or the extended depth of focus. Again, we're seeing average around anywhere from about 30 to 50% um, on those. So I think, you know, having that evidence to support, um, I think can really reassure. I think the whole goal as well is not that it's gonna 100% stop, but we're hoping to reduce it. Um, obviously providing those patients with clearer vision, but that's not ultimately the goal. The goal is to help reduce that progression. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So the United States FDA is, of course, very conservative when it comes to approving devices for children because they believe, you know, children, and rightfully so, are a vulnerable patient population. So are ortho -K and multifocal or dual focus soft contact lenses safe for children? So I think that's a valid question. And I think it's a valid question for anyone who wears contact lenses. Um, it's their medical devices. And anytime that somebody is gonna be using a medical device, it's important to have conversations about proper care and compliance and where, uh, but especially because we're dealing with a more vulnerable, vulnerable population, um, there's gonna be more questions involved. Um, but we have seen from you know, what's been reported that they're very safe um, you know, in, the eight to 12 year olds in the soft contact lens where the risks are similar to that of adults. So I think, again, we can reassure uh, parents 
that both staph lenses and ortho K, the incidence of microbial keratitis is very low. Um, so as long as we are monitoring them closely, we talk to them about what to do if they are noticing any signs and symptoms. But again, reviewing the care regimen at every single visit is so key um, so that we have proper compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully agree because compliance is key. And we know that all patients, whether they're children or adults, tend to wander when it comes to uh, following directions and, and being fully compliant. So very good advice. Thank you, Dr. Harthen. Dr. Young, what about some of the other interventions for uh, myopia? Um, but let's talk about, first of all, environmental and visual hygiene recommendations. You mentioned that earlier in, in your discussion. What should practitioners be telling patients about uh, reducing the, the risk of myopia and reducing the progression of myopia, utilizing environmental or visual hygiene recommendations? Yeah, so in my last uh, answer to your life, the question about environmental factors, I forgot to mention that the environmental factors that we're talking about today that really seem to increase the risk of developing myopia and increasing progression, progression include reduce time outdoors and also intense near work mainly associated with high levels of education so we're seeing in those populations where people don't go outside very much or they're doing a lot of academic education to you know like coaching before and after school um, as well as uh, in reaching university levels we're seeing a lot more myopia so the studies are showing that with lifestyle changes we can delay myopia. And lifestyle changes, we mean by getting outside, spending 120 minutes additional outdoors time every day. And that's because the clinical trials that were done in China and Taiwan um, found that by adding an additional 120 minutes outdoors every day, it actually delayed myopia to later on in life or reduce the number of new cases. And if you can delay my myopia later on in a child's life from like six years old to say 15 years of old, then the number of years of increasing in progression reduce and the amount of progression that they're going to experience as a six-year-old versus someone who develops myopia as a 15-year-old is significantly less. So it means that someone will be less likely to reach myopia if they started to develop myopia in their later teen years. And by reducing the risk to get to high myopia, then they're going to have less um, risks of developing the retinal complications. So the reason why we think outdoors could be very useful is because it may be related to dopamine release, which in animal studies has uh, shown to slow the eye growth of the eye. But in terms of what we're seeing in the clinical trials, it delays myopia, but as a treatment option for someone who already has myopia, going outdoors isn't going to be as good enough compared to your optical or drug interventions because mm -hmm. the outdoors time was really only slowing myopia by about 30% in those that already had myopia. And in terms of visual hygiene, you know, we're also encouraging what's known as a 2022 rule. And that's because we know that if we reduce near work intensity, we can also um, probably most likely reduce um, the development of myopia. And that's because we know that uh, near work, intense education is associated with myopia. But I think we'll talk about in detail what the 2020 rule is later on. Well, why don't we jump into that right now? Because I, I think um, in the United States, um, you know, oftentimes uh, practitioners quote the 2020 rule. And you mentioned uh, the 2020 two rule, which I often uh, quote and write about, because I think the 2022 rule is, in fact, more inclusive. So can you explain the difference between those two? Yeah, I think that the, the, well, the 2020 rule and the 2022 rule, no one's done a specific clinical trial on these, but oh. it is actually based on some of the evidence, because we know that uh, what they say by 2022 means 20 minutes of every 20 minutes of close work children should gaze in the distance of at least 20 feet for 20 seconds and that's to really just uh, reduce the near work intensity because we know that intense near work is associated with uh, myopia 
And then the two has been added at the end because that's a convenient way to remember two hours of extra outdoors time every day. So 20 minutes, every 20 minutes of close work, look into the distance for at least uh, 20 seconds and go outside for two hours per day. Mm-hmm. And then in addition, we should also be advocating to um, maintain a near work distance of at least 30 centimetres away from, you know, your screen or your print just to um, reduce the intensity of what we do up close. Yeah, I think that's very important. What, as I observe children on their iPhones, typically they're holding their, their iPhone about, you know, 10 centimetres away from their eyes and you know, that's, that's a very intense uh, working distance. So that minimum 30 centimeter working distance, I think is, is very important along with the 2022 rule. And, you know, again, the emphasis on spending more and more time outdoors. What's been interesting has, um, it's been those studies that have come out during the, you know, the lockdown showing, showing that there's been myopic shifts in certain populations of kids that have done a lot of um, intense study indoors that whole time and so you know we can't dismiss the fact that lifestyle is quite important indeed indeed so let's jump ahead and and talk about spectacles for a moment so would it be fair to say that traditional single vision spectacles don't exacerbate myopia but they don't really help slow the progression either is that true um, yeah, there's been a, quite a few uh, clinical trials as well as uh, a meta-analysis done. So some of the individual studies report that uh, traditional single vision spectacles didn't cause myopia to progress faster. Another one reported that it did um, cause myopia to progress faster. So given that we've got a whole range of studies reporting that there is some, there is possibility of risk of Uh, exacerbating myopia and then no help at all in terms of slow myopia progression down. Um, As practitioners, we now know that there's an increased risk associated with myopia linked to excessive axial elongation in terms of vision impairment and ocular disease. So now that we have all these available uh, clinical treatments such as ortho-K, um, multifocal type soft contact lenses, as well as spectacle myopia control options and drug therapies, it really does make sense to go to something that's more innovative, especially now that the research has really progressed and we've got the, the interventions available now, whereas in the past we didn't have any alternative except for single vision spectacles. So mm-hmm. I prefer not to you know, take on any risk that there could be progression with single vision spectacles in any children. So I'd, I'd advise to go for myopia management options. Mm-hmm. So I, I note that there's a number of novel spectacle designs uh, that are not yet FDA approved, uh, but hopefully coming soon, that are available in Canada and in Australia and also parts of, of Europe. Can you just talk a little bit about those novel spectacle designs and, and you know, in, in general, broadly, how they work? Yeah, so a lot of these are spectacle optical interventions. Um, they work by providing myopic defocus in the peripheral parts of the retina. So they um, focus the image in front of the retina so that um, it gives a stimulus to slow eye growth. In Compared to single vision spectacles, at the peripheral retina, um, the image is focused behind the eye. So that's the stimulus Mm -hmm. to eye growth. So the novel aspect of these new spectacle designs, such as the HAL lenses and the DIMS lens, um, their trade names are known as um, Stellas de Mio Smart. They have have lots of uh, circular patterns in the peripheral part of the spectacle lens. So DIMS stands for Defocus Incorporated um, Multi-Segments. So they're spherical segments providing myopic defocus. And the HAL lens stands for Highly Aspherical Lenslets. So they have aspheric lenslets around the peripheral part of the spectacle lens, and they provide a volume of myopic defocus in the peripheral Mm -hmm. part of the retina to slow the eye growth. And these two lenses are are being reported in the peer-reviewed journals to slow myopia on average about 50 to 60% in terms of the refractive error and the axial elongation over a period of two years. 
So they're clinically very effective. And then the other one that's available in Canada is the, the it's known as um, the dot lens and it was presented in, in the abstracts at the International Myopia Conference previously and their trade name is known as Kiko. And it, that works on uh, a change in the, the contrast acuity. Mm -hmm. So there's not been a peer reviewed publication on that one out yet, but it just goes to show there's a lot of good spectacle options available today now so that, you know, there's an option for every patient out there depending on their lifestyle and risk factors and preferences. And spectacle options, I think, are, are really a great option because they're convenient, they're low risk and can be used at all ages. And it's just more options for everyone and it's better for our profession that we have all these tools available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully agree. So let's, let's hope these novel spectacle designs uh, receive FDA approval soon because children need these designs. And finally, uh, Dr. Young, let's talk about topical low-dose atropine, you know, which is widely prescribed around the world to slow the progression of myopia. Um, how, how does topical low-dose atropine work in slowing myopia? Yeah, topical low-dose atropine um, is thought to work by uh, acting on the adenosine receptors oh, sorry, the muscarinic receptors, and then somehow acting through the choroid and slowing eye growth um, and possibly somewhere acting in the ciliary body and um, affecting the accommodation. Um, but the actual mechanism for slowing eye growth and slowing the axial elongation is, is a bit unclear at this stage. But we know that there's a variety of low-dose uh, atropines that are being used. And that's because previously 0.01% was the most widely reported um, low-dose atropine uh, that was, the, was the most widely reported um, low-dose atropine concentration. And the ATOM2 study reported that it was very effective at the time slowing um, refractive error by about 59%. However, the slowing the axial length wasn't clearly seen. And so the lab study, the most recent study out of Hong Kong, investigated what level of low dose atropine is most effective. So they compared 0 0.01, 0 0.025 and 0.05% and found that 0.05% was the most effective in terms of slowing the, the refractive error and the axial length. Mm -hmm. And so given this, most clinicians now are going to use 0.05% over 0.01% because the 0.01% wasn't really clinically slowing um, the axial elongation. And then mm -hmm. there's very minimal um, adverse effects with 0.05 in terms of photophobia, pupil dilation, and um, near accommodation loss. So today there are studies looking at combination therapy, um, incorporating, for example, orthokeratology with the 0.01% atropine. But interestingly, adding 0.01% to the ortho-K combination therapy did enhance the effect um, mm -hmm. compared to ortho-K alone or 0.01% alone. So the reasons for that remain unclear. So there'll be a lot more work coming out. But the, the jury is still out regarding 0.01% because most of the studies on 0.01% were done in Asian children. So Asian children have much darker iris pigmentation. So there could be differences in how um, European children may respond to 0.01% because of the differences in iris pigmentation. So there are mm -hmm. studies underway still looking at 0.01% in parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you for that very nice uh, summary of these various interventions. Uh, a lot is happening and uh, certainly over the next several years, there'll be a number of new products available, yeah, especially in the United States that uh, practitioners can, can utilize to slow the progression of myopia. So very exciting time in myopia management. I want to jump back to you, Dr. Harthen. Uh, you know, oftentimes uh, parents ask, so what are the benefits of myopia management? How would you summarize that? What are, what are the short and long-term benefits of myopia management? I think there are a couple of things to look at. Obviously, someone who is a lower myo myope um, just has better function, whether they're corrected or uncorrected. They just have better functional ability um, and visual performance compared to somebody who is a higher myope. Um, so I think that's one. Um, when these kids get to be 
older, maybe they're young adults and they are considering perhaps a surgical option. Um, they're gonna have better outcomes um, when they consider refractive surgery perhaps. Um, they'll have better outcomes, less residual um, refractive error. Um, perhaps there's gonna be less complications down the road. But I think the biggest one, and I think this is where we really need to kind of emphasize it, is gonna have the most, not only clinical significance, but also the most impact is that it reduces the risk of visual impairment. We're gonna have less risk of myopic maculopathy. Um, that's gonna be reduced um, by 40% for every one diopter that we see in reduction. And then we're also then gonna have a reduction of visual impairment by 20%. So I think that's kind of where we really need to you know, drive it home and that yes, they'll have better visual performance, they'll have better functionality, but it's really that taking a look at reducing that risk of visual impairment. Mm -hmm. I certainly fully agree with that. I mean, and there's many types of visual impairment. You mentioned myopic. Yeah, yeah, In, yeah. absolutely. Cataracts, glaucoma, you know, retinal detachment, all of those different mm -hmm. things that can have, you know, permanent visual impairment. Um, and that may not seem like a big issue when you have an eight-year-old in your chair, um, but if we can do something about it to help prevent that when they are older, I think that we need to do our part to not only, you know, manage that, but also help educate. I think the statistic you mentioned is one that every optometrist should commit to memory. And that's, as you said, slowing myopia by one diopter reduces the likelihood of a patient developing myopic maculopathy by 40%. That is a in, in, you know, in the world of, of eye disease, that's a huge reduction in, in the likelihood. So yeah, that's, that's a statistic. Thank you for sharing that with us. So back to you, Dr. Young, when should myopia management be implemented? Uh, the consensus from the International Myopia Institute is that any child who is clinically diagnosed with myopia, for, ex for example, minus 050 diopters or worse in terms of spherical equivalent of refractive error, and you've ruled out any other systemic secondary or binocular vision issues, then you have the, you have the right to start myopia management. You're justified by the evidence because we need to start as soon as possible in a young child who is myopic if we want, that, want to prevent them from reaching high myopia and developing the conditions that Dr. Hardham uh, just mentioned. And someone who has a family history of myopia or high myopia, who has the lifestyle risk factors for myopia, such as uh, a lot of near work, um, spending all day on screens, not going outside, we, and East Asian ethnicity, for example, these are, these are really alarm bells that tell us we've got to start myopia management ASAP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it true that, that the earlier a child becomes myopic, the, the greater risk to developing high myopia? Yes, um, that is very true. And some of the work that's been published, um, you know, by San Caradog et al. in I showed the rates of progression in children at six years of age, they could be um, progressing by minus one diopters um, at six years of age. And then if they develop myopia at 15 years of age, they might only be progressing at minus 0.5 diopters. So if someone develops myopia at six years of age, if they're progressing minus one year after year for a few years, they, they'll definitely be highly myopic by the time they're uh, 12 or 15 years of age. And so it is very critical that we get in early. And now that we have those axial length curves and refractive error curves published for uh, European and Chinese kids by some of the uh, groups out of Wenzhou and Rotterdam, we can see even from those axial length based curves, the, the increase is greater at a younger age when they develop myopia. So it's very critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you define high myopia? Um, yeah, so this is also a good question because there have been so many different definitions for high myopia. In the literature, there's minus eight diopters or more. Some people are quoted as minus five diopters or more or minus six diopters or more. And the WHO report on myopia and high myopia recommended a, a definition of minus five diopters or more um, to be high myopia because in those populations, 
if you're minus five diopters uncorrected, you are legally blind. Um, for the International Myopia Institute, we recommended minus six diopters or more, and that's based on, on most of the studies using minus six diopters or more, and also at minus six diopters or more, the risk increases even more significantly for ocular complications. So we do recommend overall that your definition should depend on your setting. So maybe in a clinical setting, you might like to use minus five as well. You're quite justified because minus five as an optometrist, you'd already go to high index or you'd, you'd probably benefit from wearing contact lenses because of the quality of life improvement. So research, we might use minus six because of the um, risks of ocular disease and um, changes we see. Mm -hmm. Is there an axial length definition as well? Yeah, the axial length um, definition isn't, there's no consensus about that. It's quite new because we're still trying to understand a lot about the axial length. But a lot of the times we're seeing in the literature, a 26 millimeters or more is when most people are highly myopic. Um, minus five doctors or minus six doctors definitely equates to 26 millimeters or more. And you also see... Um, visual impairment risk increase significantly at 26 millimetres or more. Mm -hmm. And I think over time, we'll probably reach a consensus on what axial length is for low myopia, what axial length will be for high myopia, and what it may be for mm -hmm. pathologic myopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully agree. So 26 millimetres in axial length is a number that everyone should remember. Mm -hmm. that, that at the moment uh, is, is one that we're quite certain of. Dr. Harthen, when should myopia management tapered or discontinued? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we have seen some evidence that myopia continues to progress in the later teenage years and even into adulthood just with the work demands. And as we heard earlier with some of the visual demands with um, schoolwork. Um, so I don't think that we can say this age cutoff is when, you know, we should stop our myopia management. Um, you know, as long as I think the benefits outweigh the potential risks of the myopia management plan that we are doing, um, I think that it should be continued until we see no change in that axial elongation. I think we should really monitor these patients closely and not only look for that, you know, annual refractive progression, but really look at that axial elongation to help inform us of our decisions about how we manage these patients. And each patient is going to have that individualized comprehensive management plan. We may not do the same thing for every single patient based on the age in which we see them or how fast they may be progressing. Um, so I think really to individualize our approach to managing them, but to continue it until we see them stop progressing as far as that axial elongation is concerned. Mm -hmm. And when you say stop progressing, you mean... 0 0.05 millimeters or less of axial elongation change. Is that, is that correct? I think that's hard. That's a hard number to say. Again, there's, is it 0 0.05? Is it 0 0.1? Sometimes we maybe expect that 0 0.1 mm -hmm. in that certain age group between the six to 14 age group. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, again, another one of those numbers that we maybe have to mm -hmm. come to a consensus on. Um, but yeah, less than probably that 0 0.05, 0 0.1 is going to be that number that we're going to have to watch. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't just solely rely on refractive error alone. Indeed, indeed. So what happens when myopia management treatment is discontinued? Uh, have, have you experienced rebound in, in the patients at the Illinois College of Optometry? Um, not a lot, <laughs> which is great. I think, you know, looking at a lot of the literature, uh, seeing more rebound in obviously a higher dose atropine, but that's not utilized. There is some debate about whether or not we see rebound effect with orthokeratology. Um, uh, there's 
you know, limited kind of evidence to support some of that, but not a lot of rebound. Um, again, I think it depends on when it started, how long the patient is treated for, um, when is it discontinued, um, were they started at an older age with, or were they started at a younger age? So there are a lot of factors in terms of when it's discontinued and do we see that rebound effect? Um, but we try to treat them early um, and continue to treat them so we don't have as much of a rebound effect. Okay, very good. Dr. Young, what do you say to a parent of a myopic child who says, I've never heard of myopia management? What, what do you say to that parent? Yeah, um, that is probably a very common question we're asked. I'd, I'd say to them, yeah, I understand a lot of people haven't heard about myopia management and that's because in the past, um, all we could really do about myopia was correct the vision with, you know, spectacles or contact lenses that didn't actually slow the increase in the myopia. But just in the past uh, decade or so, there's been a lot more research coming out. And even in the past five years, that's when we've actually been able to have treatment options available to meet the, meet the research and be available to patients today. And the research shows that these optical um, solutions such as these myopia control spectacles, these soft contact lenses, these hard lenses that you sleep in overnight, ortho K, and there's also an eye drop, do work to slow the increase in myopia effectively. And some of these are FDA approved to slow myopia in children in many parts of the world. So I'd also mention that um, the WHO has written a report on myopia and high myopia and recommended that these that there's evidence to slow myopia with these types of treatment options and that people all over the world are starting to use myopia management um, successfully and it works. So keeping the message to the point, um, keeping it simple, um, even using written material that you can download mm -hmm. online. So there's uh, patient communication flyers available from myopia profiles, for example, um, that show the, in the risks for developing myopia. Um, and there's also the BHVI myopia calculator that plots where the child is currently in terms of their myopia and where they would be with or without treatment. So showing these images graphically to the parent and and then writing down or giving them a leaflet to take home so they can look things up is very helpful. But really being confident and reassuring the parent that these options, there's evidence for it, there's mm -hmm. FDA approval for some of them. And I think often they, parents and um, patients really do trust the optometrist or the eye care mm -hmm. practitioner because we, this is what we do. We have the knowledge and the skills to um, manage their visual problems. Very good answer. I, I agree with you. I, I think this question of, you know, I've never heard of myopia management. I, I, I think this comes up virtually every day. Yeah, I think it's important to also make sure you're prepared beforehand. So sometimes it's pretty tricky to answer questions off the cuff because there are questions. Some parents are very inquisitive and they want to know the numbers. So just having something prepared in advance and knowing what you're going to say helps. And also mm -hmm. having your staff around you trained up to answer questions from the parents so that before the parents come to you, they already feel confident that they're going to, you know, have their needs addressed and their, pay, their child's needs addressed. I think that's a great point because in, in most practices, uh, patients spend the majority of their time with staff. So the staff have to be very well versed and, and have to be well trained in answering these types of questions. Well, let's uh, jump to our final question for this session, and uh, that's looking into the crystal ball. So how will eye care professionals manage childhood myopia 10 years from now? Dr. Harthen, how would you answer that question? Well, I hope that 10 years from now, it's no longer something new or newer um, here. I hope that it's more standard of care. Um, that we are providing this to all of our patients and that all patients have access to it, regardless um, of socioeconomic status, that this truly is something that we're providing to all of our patients um, as early as possible. So 
you know, we have a lot of buzz about it right now and, oh, and getting on board as far as, you know, new uh, technologies, um, more, hopefully more FDA approval, but I truly hope that in 10 years that this is standard of care. Mm -hmm. Yes, fully agree. Dr. Young, how would you answer that question? Um, yeah, I really hope that in 10 years it will be standard of care, but uh, we have to, as educators in universities, we also have a big role to play to keep educating our students so that all the successive graduates coming out will, will see myopia management as part of standard of care, just adding on to what Dr. Harden has said. But I'm going to think big picture about what kind of treatments we'll have in future. I think as optometrists, we'll, we'll likely be including smart devices in our holistic package of treatment for patients that are going to monitor the patient's um, exposures to light levels, outdoors time and new work so that we'll have all this information downloaded to our computers when we start seeing the patients and give them counselling and, and monitor their compliance to their interventions. And in the future, there'll be even more myopia management options because we're seeing so much work being done in this area. Even now, there's a lot of other drugs being trialled in, in animals and, and there are, you know, dopamine and, and caffeine eye drop trials being trialled in children currently. And then there's all these new devices coming out right now. They're measuring axial length. Maybe in the future, myopia management is going to be even more personalised. Some will come in and have their whole ocular shape scanned and then you'll have the spectacle or ortho K lens or soft contact lens um, custom made to their aberrations so that they're getting the maximum peripheral plus or myopic defocus delivered to their eye. And perhaps a, a drug delivery option implanted in their ortho K or soft contact lens so that we can do the combination therapy. So we're gonna mm -hmm. incorporate everything we can, I think. Anyway, that's how I hope things will be so that we can give the best to our patients. It really is an exciting time in myopia management. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Young and Dr. Harthen for your wisdom. And uh, we're going to jump now into some questions that the audience has submitted. Uh, so we're going to play Stump the Stars here. So the, uh, the first question we have is uh, from Malaysia. And um, the question is, what about uh, children who are very high myopes? Um, this practitioner from Malaysia says, you know, how do you slow the progression of an 11-year-old child who's already minus nine diopters. So what, what would you recommend for that type of patient who's, who's already progressed very rapidly and, and is well above the threshold of high myopia? Dr. Harthen, what, what would you do if you saw this type of patient in, in your clinic? So there's probably a couple of approaches that you could do for this one, but I probably would not do ortho K on this particular patient. Um, you know, if you look at the higher myopia, the, the pro study, you could do partial reduction um, with that. And you still would probably see, um, you know, some reduction, but I think I would probably choose a different option uh, for that patient and probably do a soft multifocal or do combination therapy. Um, that's probably how I would approach it is do combination with um, a low dose atropine and probably a multifocal. Mm -hmm. That's how I personally would do it. Dr. Young, what about you? Um, I think in this type of situation, because there haven't been studies that have shown that we have really been able to slow the progression in these types of highly myopic kids at such a young age, I would, I would also you know, explain to the patient that we can try these options they may or may not be um, very effective, but it's worth trying just so that we can, um, you know, let the patient have realistic expectations. And then as Dr. Hartham said, yeah, soft multifocal type contact lenses with, you know, probably a plus 2.50 add and using 0.05% atropine as the combination therapy. And then the, or we can go for ortho K partial um, correction because we know that the partial correction with ortho K, so residual correction with the spectacles and then ortho K at night, mm -hmm. um, that could be a possible method as well. So mm -hmm. we don't really know in these cases how effective mm -hmm. it will be, but it's worth trying. Okay, very good. Yeah, very complex when a child is already nine diopters uh, myopia when they're only uh, 
uh, very young. Dr. Harthen, you, you mentioned several times axial length and the importance of measuring axial length. So uh, at the Illinois College of Optometry, how is axial length measured? Is it done with uh, non-contact uh, optical biometry or is it done with other methods? We have several methods, but usually it's non-contact. Um, and you know, for a while, probably I'd say maybe even five years ago, we probably weren't measuring it as routinely as we should have. Um, but now on every consultation, it's being measured. Um, we're thinking about perhaps measuring this on all of our young um, children who come through our pediatric clinic um, just as a baseline. But um, yes, we are starting to measure it more and more frequently, understanding the importance of baseline um, and then at every uh, visit afterwards. Yeah, fully agree with that. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Harthen. Um, Dr. Young mentioned that uh, a number of studies on topical low-dose atropine have shown uh, that uh, there's increased efficacy with 0.025 or 0.05% um, uh, atropine. What do, what do you typically prescribe at the Illinois College of Optometry? Uh, we usually do a 0 0.05. You are, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what would yes. cause you to prescribe a lower dose? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a good, I think for a while we were probably, we were doing the lower um, because that's what the literature was showing. Um, and then now with the newest reports that are out there, so it's showing that the 0 0.05, not only showing the reduction in the refractive error, but really it's that axial length, and that's what we're after. So that's why we've switched to the 0 0.05. So I, I don't have a reason as to why we would maybe do something else. I mean, I know that there are some who are still are, I think is what we can get. Um, it just depends on who we're working with, the compounding pharmacy and um, who's uh, mm -hmm. managing the patient. Um, but I think we try to really follow evidence-based mm -hmm. medicine, uh, the evidence-based literature as much as we can and how we're managing these patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly agree with that. And of course, it's a very exciting time in the, the realm of low-dose atropine uh, since there are a number of pivotal phase three trials uh, occurring in the United States right now. So right. We'll soon have the, uh, the evidence published and, and we'll have a lot more data. Yeah, and I think part of that too is like uh, part of our clinic too, we're in, involved with some different trials. So, you know, getting our patients enrolled with that. Um, so some of our clinicians are involved with some of the, you know, different studies. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the benefits to it being at the academic institution is mm -hmm. um, having access to those uh, studies as well. Indeed. Dr. Young, I want to go back to you in, in a question kind of related to one I asked earlier. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, parents will have, uh, will come in with um, two or three myopic children. And um, so, you know, sometimes a parent will ask, well, I don't understand what you're saying. My, you've never mentioned myopia management for my 15 year old myopic child. And now you're recommending myopia management for my eight-year-old child, what happened? Why, why didn't you ever mention it before? How would you answer that? Yeah, that can be a very tricky question. I, I'd be honest and, and I would say at the time when your first child developed myopia, the evidence wasn't um, available to suggest that there was much more we could do beyond uh, pre prescribing spectacles or you know, spectacles to correct the vision. There was nothing available to slow the increase in myopia, nor was there enough information about that we could do that. But things have advanced in our profession and in our area. There's been a lot of research done um, because myopia has been increasing in the world and in the States only very recently, really. And so... It's only now that there's new technology available. But given that this new technology is available now, I'd like to offer it to, you know, your, your, younger, your younger child now and do something about um, slowing the increase in myopia for your youngest child that we couldn't do for your older child. 
mm-hmm. just being honest like that and and I don't think they can fault you really because you know you've done your best as a practitioner mm-hmm. indeed indeed well good thank you thank you for that explanation because it's a it's a tricky one and it's certainly a question that does come up in clinical practice the final question um, is regarding the novel spectacle designs uh, that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Young. Um, of course, none of these are FDA approved yet. Uh, again, they're available in many parts of the world. Um, and so the question here is, so uh, again, what, uh, what are the names of these novel spectacle designs? And I'll go ahead and answer that since, since I know that. It's the Hoya Myosmart, the uh, Sight Glass Pico, and the Essilor Stellist are the trade names of these uh, novel spectacle designs, which again are not yet FDA approved, but hopefully coming soon. So just wanted to clarify that for our listeners. So with that, we've completed our session for this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harthen and Dr. Young, for joining us. Your, your expertise is, is really amazing, and I, I've certainly learned a lot tonight as well. So thank you for joining us, and thank you to the wonderful audience that we have tonight. Um, it, it's really been a pleasure presenting and, and uh, talking about our favorite topic, myopia management. Thank you, and uh, have a very nice evening. Good night. Thank you.